Ông cười cho Ông Chúng tôi đã cảm ơn tôi Các chúng ta 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 đã cảm ơn tôi Nanti mui ke samanaka sedap dengan tradisi natan berapa pihki, pihak pun neng damanaka samanaka pihak sah dan daul lerobaika berapa nek jam dini di John Campbell dal ang jam reh banpe samanaka kapi tengai ti perbai kay bejika cenam pipon dapi kerlong ter ler panjah sokop hip nong kai jo rum samanaka berapa lu ing seri dal nebrek ni ang jam reh neng đào cả ở phía kia để bẻ bón là ứng phương đề xuất thán bằng chọc nơi cách nhà ca sạm nạc ca nụ hay bởi tổ mốc ông dùm ra nâng bằng tổ sạm nạc ca lưu ông thực đây sẽ nằm rương sâu sôn phí xa lạc sôn mũi đây là nâng bằng tổ thuốc đại ca sẽ đắp dạng khai cắm xạ xây đại miên là hạ sân niêm thị xí đạp lưu dũ phạm rời bằng bờ tạm cao bí phía để bàn cử đồng tục Lúc trái xe có một thí là người ca bí dự thản hợp hiệp bọt tầm miên, bọt tầm miên phía kỳ nâng bọc cô lệ ảnh dùm đẹp có hành chư ở chỗ rùm nâng không cách nhầm nào cả sạm nạc ca tiền phí này. Đời mùi mà đoàn đạch cho lại bí khí nền ấy. Xôn cổ bộ lộp thiên, chúng bố sạm nạc ca lòng bông này, cổ phía kỳ tầng ốc miên bọt tầm miên, lực lên tài chôn chọc chào lộp nôn chí nâng khía xung hôn miên bọt tầm miên đồng bằng tục không khốn khăn khám bằng tục sạm nạc ca này. Hai chân chọc chào yên sở rí, ạ vọt tầm miễn đài mùa hạt sọc kập hiếp, bằng tay dùng tam, thì khách lẹ bằng sất miễn đài cầm nọt đọc bọt chân chọc chào, ai kết xa lệ y bí rồi xam sập rằm bí, chân chọc chào bàn lẹ bằng sất miễn vọt tầm miễn nơi khăn nông ầm lòng bê nơi đầm nà ca xạm nà ca, nơi ca sạp sạc khai cám xạ xây đài miễn rà hạt sở niếm thi xí đạp bê dú, bàm rồi bàm bì, đài ông chùm rẻ nâng sạp sạc khai cám Sạ xây ban bình chạy thá, tam sơ mặt tập hiếp đại cột ảnh đấng, cư cột mình miên chọp tầm nẹ tầm nông, nhịn lô hất, rư nhịn bôn chìm môi nâng chôn chọp chào tàng bay rút, cư lộ nôn chí, yên xa rí, nâng kia xong hôn, rư phía kỳ đa mặt đấng rọt bạ về nì nà môi, đại trợ ban tự tui xóa nơi khăn nông rừng đây nì tì. Sạ xây ban thua xong bọt vụi hói, nơi chùm phô mốc lục tạ đồng bọng đáy, ca bì bê bật đang đang đọc bạn này đại miền Hà Sơn Niêm thi C C P ba sáu pì số một con ba một con và chị bạn tôi này ông đã xong chấp đầu thừa đi tiệm thi này năm là cá sạm là cá tìm mui cứ sẽ để than bằng chọc nở cây bị phía xa đánh đáo lừa đảo bài ca bảo nợ chấm niên đại ông chấm đẹp nông đào bị tika chun từ cầm bị tika bị đầy lục yên xử lý đang bày miền đảo cát đang khung ca tăng sầm nu đang khung ca thuyết sơn thàn bằng chọc lục mây tử vi bằng biên bài nhà ấy lục ai chơi bằng chơi chọc ai lược nó bị cào ấy nữa lục mây tử vi lần này chiếc màn cầm nọt bị hơi thay ở phía sầm na cá tìm mùi mồn lục mây tử vi anh đã chiết cà phê cây nôn chi ông quay cho lần này ông dùng rẻ Sầm rách thá phơ sạm nạc ká sạm đập đầy thần thán đọc bọc phía ký Đại phía phôn từ nâng cách dùm nạc ká sạm nạc ká sạm đập đọc bài ká đọc bọc nạ chùm niên Chìa môn sân nạ mây ở phía chóp nơi cách bọc phía xa sạm nạc ká tì mùi Và lúc miền bánh hạ ấy chăm đòl phía khỏi phía chóp Lúc ai chỉ lực bàn chùm phú bánh hạ đại phía phôn từ nâng cách dùm nạc ká sạm nạc ká lưu ông dựng đầy dương ban tham gia chơi hơi có mọi rung khan ấy bị phô lục cầm lúng đôi rung khan dương cà pì sạm na cá cà pì ngay bờ hoa mà đòn hơi đời được khăn ông cây chấm na cá này tệ bị thí cứ mền mền chia sứt bờ lúng để trời châu được khăn ông sạm na cá này tì sạm na cá này bờ gần châu cứ lúc châu thông điệp chỉ nét sang cây cà bẩn nọ sạm na cá này dương ban chuẩn bị chơi hơi cà pì ngay bờ hoa thá phơi thân nam cá sẽ đáp đền thân thán được bỏ Phía kì đã phía bón tên nâng rộ bài ca rộ bọc nẹ chùm niên chôn khám bèl.
สมเชยลูกเมตวีอันตรเมตวีกาปีกระไรลูกเอียงสรีอองยิมเรียบันสมรจิรุ่ยเฮยปัญหาเมียนไอ้คือกรอยปีลจบสัมนาคาตีมุยอองยิมเรียบนึงพอดอลก้าไอ้เพียกีเปียปอนต์เตติดเลือกลายเดปัญหาต่างหลายเดเปียปอนต์ตึงสัมนาคาบันตอบยืมมันอันนี้อาไอ้เตสมลูกเมตวีกาเปียกได้กรมกาเปียกได้ลูกยิงสรีทเวตได้สนทานอบักลุนอันตรายที่ดับบวนในไอซีซีพีอาร์คันติกาเพื่อการปกครองอันเซิลและพลิตเลอร์ไรท์อันตรายสัญญาอันรัดยึดสุดประชาชนสุดพลอร์ดวั
while many of our questions posed to the doctors, both at the hearing of uh, 21 September and especially on 8 November, turned on the issue of competency to stand trial as related to the fair trial right of being able to meaningfully participate in the proceedings. You must not lose sight of the fact that we, that is the Ying Sri defendants, have not made the proceedings against the Ying Sri. From the medical report, the testimony of the doctor and the contextual reality that we are dealing with, that is an 88-year-old in a precarious physical condition, it is rather self-evident that the issue of competency will at some point blossom into an issue that we need to be confronted head-on, and no doubt will require us to meet the challenge and find them a mutual understanding to enable us to unite in some measures and find a just and acceptable solution. Certainly, we are not there yet. We submit that the use of today's hearing for the purposes of making late submissions on competency is not only premature, but a misuse and an abuse of the time that you, the trial chamber, has graciously allowed the parties to make observations today. Just Cartwright, in her remarks at the close of the hearing last Thursday, rightfully reminded us all that for the time being, Mr. Ingsri has waived his presence at the proceedings of all the witnesses listed to appear for the remainder of this month, and I would dare say perhaps for the month of December as well, given the pace of the and the trial proceedings and the nature of the testimony of these witnesses. Therefore, aside from the fact that no submissions have been made as to competency, let me underscore that questions, however sharply put to the physicians, do not amount to submissions of application. The matter is not right for discussion because the proceedings can carry on without interruption irrespective of Ms. Singh Sri's current state of health. Now that may change in the next days, weeks, or months, or it may not. But that, here's where we are today. Now we can devote with relative ease a significant period of time arguing the merits and shortcomings of Dr. Campbell's reports and testimony. In fact, I can do so on the cuff and spend the next day, if not the entire week, dicing and slicing this testimony. We see no point of doing so at this moment. This should not be interpreted, as a concession or as a purposeful exercise in tacitly accepting the views expressed by Dr. Campbell. Quite the contrary, we take grave exception to the manner and scope of his latest examination of Mr. Shree, as well as some of his rather, how should I put it, fanciful conclusions. And I mean no disrespect to the doctor. But from my observation, my personal observations of Mr. Ingsri, and I know that I've been cautioned by the prosecution that I'm giving evidence, the man that I see when I meet is quite a different man than the one described by Dr. Campbell. But again, this is neither the time nor place to go into the merits of his particular uh, testimony and findings. With that in mind, however, we submit that the time is indeed right and that we do submit that it is both reasonable 
Something very common within the civil law system, even though experts are chosen from a list by the trial chamber, where testimony is taken and where it would appear that there are some differences or questions arise from the testimony, nothing prevents the judges from selecting additional to hear from, and I dare say that nothing prevents the parties from making recommendations to the judges as to who may be a suitable expert to be called upon. As Dr. Campbell himself acknowledged during his testimony, second and even third opinion from other experts are common in the medical field. Those were his submissions, and we suggest that that is exactly what we are seeking to do here today. Dr. Burstein was consulted on a pro bono basis, given the limited confines of the time and, of course, material that we were allowed to provide to him. He submitted a letter and we have indicated quite expressly that that letter was not a medical report. It did, however, call into question the methodology and the sources by Dr. Campbell, albeit he did not have the all relevant material that Dr. Campbell had, had available himself, including the previous report and, of course, the one-on-one examination. But nonetheless, he did provide a basic assessment in the form of a letter. He is not associated and has never been associated with the Insuri defense team. I've never met the man, never spoke to him personally. He submitted an email, as you noted, as was provided to you, merely seeking a consultation on a pro bono basis. He did so. He is, however, highly regarded in the field in the United States. And he comes from perhaps one of the most prestigious, if not the most prestigious, medical schools in the United States. He is a professor there. He has a long-standing interest in issues dealing with competency, including the relationship of the physical and emotional factors of competency. He has authored extensively in the field, and he is highly regarded in the field of forensic psychiatry. We see no reason why the trial chamber should not reach out to Dr. Bernstein, even for exploratory reasons to determine his bona fides and the extent to which he may be of assistance to the trial chamber and what will undoubtedly become an issue in the future. And that is Mr. Insuri's for trial. This is an issue that is not going to go away. At 88 years old, with heart problems, with breathing problems, with prostate uh, problems, uh, with back problems, you name it. This situation is simply not going to get better. He may be stabilized, but at his age, normally, the status quo is about the best one can do. And it's even Dr. Campbell's rather generous, generous, uh, description of Ms. Insuri uh, admitted 
that we need to be guarded on the future health status of Mr. Ingsuri. We ask that the trial chamber contact the first time to request an independent evaluation of Mr. Ingsuri to enable him to render the complete evaluation. We also request that the trial chamber provide him with all the information that was made available to Dr. Campbell. That is, a medical report and evaluations of Mr. Chiri that have been completed to date, the transcripts of the previous doctor's testimony regarding the patient's health and all-related documents and memoranda from the trial chamber. Now, the trial chamber may feel that, again, this request may not be quite right yet, that we may have to wait. But nonetheless, we wish to put the trial chamber on notice that the inquiry defense respectfully requests an independent evaluation Irrespective of Dr. Campbell's examination and reports and his expertise and his willingness to come and give testimony, we, we submit an independent evaluation will be required in the future. Of course, we have no objections to the prosecution and the civil parties in proposing experts of their own. Since no doubt they are likely to assume that anything proposed by the industry defense is self-serving, defense-oriented, subjective. And that's understandable. That's the world over. And that's how defense lawyers are normally viewed by the prosecution when it comes to making such proposals. Proposing experts who are defense-oriented, we submit the doctrine that we are proposing is not. You have a CV. Leave it up to you. Mr. President, Your Honor, these are our submissions. If the trial chamber wishes for us to make written submissions, uh, and asking for the appointment of an independent expert, especially the one that we have recommended, we are prepared to do so. On the other hand, if the trial chamber is inclined to reject this request, we would reject this request, then we would appreciate a reasoned decision. Unless there are any questions, uh, these are our submissions. And again, we wish to thank the uh, trial chamber for examining Mr. and for providing us with two public hearings on Mr. Ingsuri's status. And we want to stress that we know and we've been noted uh, that this was on the trial chamber's accord. And we are grateful for that. Thank you very much.
Thank you, President. Uh, Mr. Karnavas, uh, the Chamber has uh, a couple of um, questions arising out of your submission. Uh, we are left being unclear as to whether you assert that Yeng Sari is currently unfit or not, or whether, for example, he can participate uh, from the holding cells. Uh, and uh, if you are submitting that he is uh, he's still fit to stand trial, and we clearly understood your submission that this is an elderly man whose health is frail. That, that, that's not the issue here. Uh, if, if it is indeed your position that he remains fit, albeit with all these health difficulties, why is it that you are proposing another expert and on what basis? Just to help us get a really clear path through this, please. Uh, thank you, uh, Judge Carter. Well, let me be very clear. Our position is, and has been for some time, that he is not fit. He cannot participate. He cannot participate meaningfully, at least not on the basis of international standards that this tribunal has decided to implement, which are already in the Cambodian Constitution. Uh, so that's our, that's our starting point. However, we have taken a, what I would call a very measured uh, approach. Because we are dealing with some witnesses and civil parties who may not require uh, Mr. Inksiri's participation. And given that Mr. Inksiri has gone over the material with us and has agreed that he would not, that he would waive his constitutional right to assist in his own defense and participate in the proceedings for these limited witnesses. We have agreed to go forward with the hopes that perhaps Mr. Inksiri would improve would physically improve to the point where he could be in the holding cell and he could follow the proceedings just as he was able to do prior to his last hospitalization. Up until that point, he was able, with the exception of one day, I think, when he was feeling overly dizzy, he was able to follow. Since that day, if participation means having a window of opportunity to consult with Mr. Inksri five minutes, ten minutes, fifteen minutes, then it is our rightful submission that that's not meaningful participation. For Dr. Campbell to say that he is dozed off uh, at lectures uh, and uh, didn't miss much, well, let's look at it. This is not a lecture. This is a trial proceeding. Also, Dr. Campbell at least seemed to me to be in perfect health or in very good health. He's also 20 years younger than Mr. Inksiri. He's not dozing in and out. We have observed our client, and we are of the opinion that as of this moment, he is not able to participate in his own defense. However, because of what we are doing here in court, because of the witnesses, that the trial chamber must take evidence from, but do not necessarily impact to a high degree on Mr. Inksiri, we've agreed, and Mr. Inksiri has agreed, because it's his right to wave or not wave, to go forward. Now, it could be that in January or December, Mr. Inksiri recovers. It could be, however, that we at some point will run out of witnesses that he's waived. And at that point, our position is rather unmoving. 
We are not going to budge. We are not going to wait. We're going to you know, hold our ground and you will need to make a decision. Now, if the trial chamber is convinced on what Dr. Campbell says, that Mr. Inchiri is competent and that he's capable, and that all he needs so to do is will himself into paying attention, which I think is rather uh, generous of Dr. Campbell in saying so, then the alternative, I think, is not to have Mr. Ingsari in the holding cell, but to have him here in court, in a gurney, on a bed, where the entire world and you can see whether he is dozing in and out, whether he's actually participating. And then we will be asking ourselves, as the world will be asking as well, are these the sort of international standards that apply the world over and the ones that this trial chamber, which is deemed to be the model for the rest of the country, uh, should be in So that's where we are. I thought uh, we, we, we submit that because of the report by Dr. Campbell and his testimony that it would be prudent if not now, at least down the road because as I said, when we get out of when we're through with witnesses that he's waived, we he will need to revisit this issue. We're basically kicking the can down the road, as they say. But we were doing so with the expectation that perhaps Mr. Ng Sri will get better. And one might think that he will get better if Dr. Campbell is correct. And the Cambodian doctors are all wrong as far as what exactly is causing his dizziness that his brain is getting sufficient oxygen and that all we need to do is apply a neck brace and that should, and with some adjustments, he would be able to uh, get back to uh, normal uh, So that's where we are. Uh, we are trying to, in, in a very uh, challenging uh, circumstance here, to find a way that we do not hold up the proceedings because there's business to be done at this stage where Mr. Ng Sri is willing to waive his presence. The alternative, of course, would be to file for a motion to sever at this stage. And, of course, it would be our position that were we to do that, were we to do that, then the proceedings would have to cease. They could not go on while this matter is pending. They would have to come to a grinding halt. And it might in some ways be premature because who knows, maybe this thing will improve. We doubt it, but we're willing to accommodate the chamber because we do recognize that these are important proceedings. We wish to be viewed as serious litigants. We are not trying to obstruct the proceedings. And we're trying to work with the parties as well, with the prosecution as well as with the civil parties. And I believe even Mr. Smith acknowledged in the last presentation, not this one, but before, um, when we had a hearing, if I recall correctly, he had indicated that we have enough witnesses, we should proceed and see where that takes us. I hope I have answered your question uh, just correctly.
Oui, je suis désolé, M. Carnavas, de, de prolonger cet échange, mais la Chambre aimerait avoir quelques clarifications. Il nous semble que lorsque votre client a accepté de renoncer, de participer à l'audience pour l'audition d'un certain nombre de témoins, la situation était différente de celle que nous connaissons aujourd'hui. À l'époque, votre client était hospitalisé, nous avions un certain nombre de euh, certificats médicaux qui faisaient état de problèmes euh, particuliers qui n'ont pas été, a priori, euh, sont des conclusions qui n'ont pas été maintenues a priori par le professeur Campbell. Donc ce que nous souhaiterions savoir, c'est aujourd'hui, est-ce que vous considérez que votre client est totalement incapable de participer à ce procès Est-ce qu'il est incapable de participer pour euh, des journées entières Ou est-ce que vous considérez qu'il faut euh, procéder à un aménagement euh, des, des audiences euh, Et s'il est incapable de participer à, à ce procès, quelles sont les raisons médicales exactes euh, qui euh, sous-tendent cette allégation Um, thank you, uh, Judge Laverne, and no need to apologize for prolonging the proceedings. I'm always grateful for the opportunity to expand. I'll try to, uh, to be cogent. It's our submission, Judge Laverne, having spent a lot of time with our client, that beyond a five or ten minute period, maximum, He's unable to concentrate. He gets dizzy, he, sees, he has double vision. He's unable to really follow the proceedings. Now, I understand what Dr. Campbell said. As I indicated, that is a remarkable difference from the one that we've observed. Yes, he's back here from the hospital. Why? The hospital said, well, they can no longer treat him. Uh, they, they've done the best that they can. Uh, of course, we have to recognize that Dr. Campbell came up with a very different uh, analysis of the problem uh, that's causing Mr. Ingsuri to be dizzy and unable to concentrate. But uh, we submit that the right to participate in one's trial, especially to follow along the proceedings and to give instructions, is more than just being physically present down, down in the room. If he's down in the holding cell or here in the courtroom and is half asleep or asleep, he wishes to participate, but because of his age, because of all his other medical conditions, he's unable to muster the strength to follow along on the proceedings. If he's unable to then recall what he heard and to give instructions, if he's unable to read portions of the documents that we require him to read at times in order for him to give us instructions, even though we do read documents to him, but after a certain point, he's fatigued, he's exhausted. It's not a matter of him able to control himself or the will. He can will himself to these things. We submit that in his present state, which was prior to, which was quite different and remains the same, essentially, from the time that he's gone to the hospital. He does not, he cannot follow the proceedings. Now, that may change at some point. Let me give an example. If we were at the stage where we had run out of witnesses that were, or civil parties that were uh, not necessarily that, uh, I don't want to say relevant, because all witnesses are relevant to the trial, but they didn't impact on our case to the extent that some others, like, like say, uh, Philip Short, to give an example. If we were at that stage, we would be making 
submissions to sever him for the trial. That's where we are. So it is our right for submission. From our observations, from our day-to-day -day contact with him, from our ability to work with him. Now, you have Dr. Campbell's examination and his reports and his testimony. We disagree. Based on that, we feel we need an independent evaluation. Now, you can force him to be in that room, although we would say we would want him here in the courtroom so everybody can see the state that he's in. When you have an 88-year-old man who's most of the time in a fetal position, in pain, in one way or the other, need somebody to turn him over, can't stand up, is urinating on himself without help, cannot even take his own pills, is seeing double vision, and to say that this person is actually meaningfully participating in the proceedings is a rather ridiculous uh, conclusion to reach, to put it bluntly. And so we are at the position, we're saying, we're submitting that he is not capable of participating. But we're also submitting that because he has weighed these witnesses that are not that impactful on his case, and because one never knows whether his medical condition will improve, why not go forward with the witnesses that we have at hand so we don't stop the proceedings, see if, he, if his health improves, and if it doesn't improve, then ultimately we will be faced with having to make full-blown submissions for, his, uh, for him to be severed from the proceedings. And I understand these are very, very important decisions. It impacts the civil parties. It impacts the prosecution. There is a perception of the public. There's a host of reasons that are quasi-political, might I say, as opposed to legal, and at this stage, rather than confront them, because we're going to have to confront them at some point, what we are suggesting, and we are submitting, is that we go forward. But if the trial chamber is of the opinion that he is fit, then he should be in court, and then of course we will be making immediate submissions for his severance from the case. And in, and in that we will be asking for independent, an independent evaluation. And I hope I'm very clear, Judge Laverne. I was trying to be very nuanced and tactical and, 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 and uh, diplomatic this morning. Uh, hoping that uh, I would not have to in any way attack anybody's testimony or what have you, but try to provide the trial chamber and the parties with a reasonable position of us going forward because uh, it is necessary for the, for the trial to continue as best as it can, even under the current circumstances. And I recognize that some of my colleagues on the human rights side will be faulting me for not pushing hard enough, but I'm trying to, be, to take a very measured position so that there is no, there could be no complaint that somehow we were engaged in a ruptured strategy. Thank you. Une autre clarification, M. Canavas, je suis désolé. Euh, nous comprenons donc que vous euh, prétendez que votre client n'est pas en état de participer à ce procès, qu'il est incapable. Euh, cependant, nous aimerions savoir si cette incapacité à participer au procès va jusqu'à euh, poser problème quant à sa capacité à comprendre euh, l'étendue des droits auxquels il renonce lorsqu'il renonce à l'audition d'un certain nombre de témoins. Euh, 
an excellent question. An excellent question, Judge Laverne, and thank you for asking that question. Uh, as I indicated earlier, uh, his ability to concentrate is 5 or 10 uh, minutes at a time, 15. Uh, what we have done uh, in the past, uh, we have gone through the witness statements of the witnesses that you have anticipated to call. Uh, I've gone over them personally at least a couple of times. We then have sat down with Ms. Sing Sri in, in, in small time frames so that he's able to concentrate, he's able to uh, have discussions with us for those 10 or 15 minutes that he's able to concentrate before he ex he's, he's exhausted. During those periods, we've been able to uh, discuss very briefly what we believe is the essence of the witnesses uh, or the civil parties' testimony. Uh, we, we have the summaries, of course, that were provided by the parties. We also have looked at the paragraphs to which they refer to. So we have some, we put it into context. And I can assure the trial team that were we of the position that Ms. Sing Sri was not competent, mentally competent, to issue, to give us that waiver, that would have been raised. In other words, we, and I, this is something that I, I am especially uh, sensitive about, don't want to put myself in the position of the client in deciding what should be waived and not waived. It is not my intention to, uh, to act for the client. We give advice. The client gives us instructions. From the instructions that we received, and based on our observation, we are confident, and let me underscore that, we are confident for the witnesses that he has waived thus far, and I think the last time we submitted 14 names, that Ms. Jung Sri was uh, provided a waiver that was knowing, uh, was intelligently made, and was willingly made. And so, for those, we have no problem. Now, that said, you cannot say because he's able to concentrate for 10 or 15 minutes in providing a waiver that he can actually participate in proceedings where you have testimonies, you have objections, you have rulings, and he needs instructions. There is a vast difference. And perhaps I'm, uh, I was thinking ahead of your, your follow-up question, that's why I, I, I'm, I'm uh, supplementing my remarks. Uh, sorry, Mr. Carnivus, another question. Uh, you have uh, been clarifying to the chamber that um, you consider that um, uh, Yang Sari has the mental competence to give a valid waiver. Uh, we just need to clarify one more detail. Um, uh, back on the 3rd of September, uh, Dr. Campbell and Drs. Fazel and Lena Huot did an examination which covered uh, uh, Yang Sari's <coughs> mental health status uh, and uh, found that there was nothing to be concerned about um, in particular. Now, do you accept that report? Because it was never mentioned during the hearing with, uh, uh, well, it was mentioned during the hearing with, uh, with Professor Campbell, but of course, as we know, now we well know, Professor Burstein did not have a copy of that. So uh, we just need to clarify that point. Thank you. Again, thank you. Uh, Judge Cartwright for giving me the opportunity to address this point. Sort of reminds me when I go to bed at night, I'm feeling great. I get up in the morning and I got aches and pains. What happened during the night, I don't know. But basically, on September 3rd, there was an examination. We, of course, didn't go into that examination because at that point in time, if you may recall, Mr. Ng was in this holding cell. He was waiving his presence in court but he was participating uh, from the holding cell. Lo and behold, 
Four days later, on September 7th, we visit Mr. Ng Sri uh, in his holding cell, in, in his, uh, uh, at the detention unit. Uh, we had scheduled a, uh, a one-hour meeting. And prior to arriving there, he told us he could not get out of there. So we went there and we had this, uh, a meeting that lasted approximately a half an hour, and we were trying to discuss, and I say trying to discuss, the testimony of Philip Short, who uh, interviewed Mr. Ng Sri on a couple of occasions. After that meeting, approximately a half hour or so later, we were informed by the detention facilities that he was being medevaced. He was being evacuated uh, to the hospital where he stayed there for three or four days before he was actually examined. Hence, we had the hearing later on on the 21st. So what I'm saying is, what prior on the September, the September 3 evaluation, uh, we at that, at that stage had no concern with respect to Mr. Ng Sri being able to assist us and for him to be able to participate in the proceedings because he was participating. We were seeing him during the recesses. We saw him in the morning. And we had some rather complicated witnesses, as you may recall, at the uh, end of, uh, during August, uh, where he did, in fact, uh, engage his legal team and was participating. And because of that, we saw no reason to, to challenge the report. Or to go into the report. Now we understand that that report is part and parcel, and that's what Dr. Campbell is building on. But what we're saying is, as I noted, when I get up, I go to bed at night, I'm feeling good. In the morning, I'm not feeling so good. I got some problems. That's what happens between 3 and 7, September 3 and September 7. Something happened. Why Mr. Ng Sri was fine on September 6 when I met him and I was able to discuss the testimony of the witness who had just uh, finished, and why the following day he could not get out of bed, and why a half hour later he had to be better back, and why when I visit him the following week he's in a fetal position, he looks like he's just about ready to, pa uh, to pass away, he's emaciated, and he's an oxygen. I think we're dealing with certain realities. And so while I don't want to take anything away from Dr. Campbell and the examinations performed by the doctors, Campbell, Hood, and, and Faisal on September 3, I don't think that that examination is the benchmark from where we start here today, especially when we're dealing with someone of the age and physical condition of Mr. Ng Sri. So I, I, I don't know how else to put this, and I hope I've answered your question. May I be seated? Um, ແມ່ນໄປຊິລິດເອີ້ມີ <coughs> Positions have changed um, by the defence. Uh, initially, I think the submission put forward by the defence that <coughs> they didn't want to put forward a submission as to whether he was fit to plead or not. And certainly on questioning now, it's clear that the defence's view is that uh, Yang Sari <coughs> is not fit to stand trial as of now. I think perhaps the, uh, the changing positions reflects uh, the 
the fragile situation that we're in, defence council have uh, um, referred to. Um, I mean, it's clear from Dr. Campbell uh, Mr. Yang Sari's health is, is fragile. But it's also clear for him that uh, there was no need for him to stay at the hospital anymore. He didn't require um, that medical assistance. And it's also clear that coming back to the detention centre, he required some more assistance than um, he would otherwise get. That type of assistance that Council was referring to in relation to going to the bathroom, uh, eating, uh, shower. A lot of those conditions that Dr. Campbell referred to that would require extra assistance for Yang Sari really relate to um, those matters that require him to move around. And uh, it's quite clear that perhaps between maybe the 3rd of September and then when uh, Mr. Campbell saw him. Uh, early November, that, that, that condition deteriorated a little bit. His uh, ability, to, his mobility deteriorated and he needed more assistance. Uh, that's clear. And if that's a, if that's a reflection of um, a, uh, a decline of uh, Mr. Yang Sari, um, it's clear that uh, to that extent that it has happened. However, uh, Mr. Campbell or Dr. Campbell said, and uh, we would submit, he would not have said that uh, if Mr. Yang Sari was in the immediate need of care, of critical care, um, he wouldn't have um, requested that he be taken back to the detention facility. And so, Dr. Campbell's view was that is that Yang Sari's condition is, is stable, and with the right assistance, um, as with uh, many people of, a, of an elderly age, um, he would be able to participate in this trial. Left to his own devices, which uh, is what uh, Mr. Carnivus referred to, we would have a situation where um, his, his uh, health condition would be complicated if he couldn't get to the bathroom, if he couldn't get to eat, he didn't have assistance with showering, um, and he didn't have assistance with exercise, if possible, within the limits that uh, he could. So, we do have a situation where we have a very fragile accused, um, but at the same time, we have a situation where we have an accused that um, Dr. Campbell has said is mentally fit to plead and physically fit and to stand trial. The way in which um, perhaps we would all like to see the Q stand trial in the courtroom so the public can see, that may not be the best option at this point, uh, for Mr. Yang Sari, um, we've heard the professor say that because of his back problems, it's better that perhaps he lays in bed on an incline. Um, and because, uh, and, and also he's made, uh, recommended some adjustments with the television, etc. So I think, as of now, uh, Dr. Campbell has recommended, it seems, on the basis of uh, Mr. Yang Sari's comfort level, that he watch the, um, the proceedings, participates in the proceedings from the from the holding room. And so the, the suggestion um, that he be brought into the courtroom uh, by defence counsel um, probably at this stage wouldn't be appropriate because uh, it doesn't really assist uh, Mr Yang Sari with his comfort level. So the delicate, the delicate management of an old person um, with uh, a number of uh, stable but uh, present um, conditions requires a lot of delicate care. 
when we were in the position of the 3rd of September, um, that was less needed. However, the fact that um, delicate care or extra care is required, and perhaps the trial proceeds for the moment, in a different way, with Mr. Yang Sari in the, in the holding room, with, uh, if necessary, a nurse assistant, and uh, everything that uh, Mr. Campbell has recommended, that's, that's the way that we have to proceed. But as far as the question of whether we recede or whether we proceed or not, um, on the evidence you have before you, that's not really um, a question because we we have evidence from Dr. Campbell, who is a you know, professor of geriatric medicine that has dealt with um, many, many people. Uh, similar to uh, Mr. Yang Sari, and is not a person that uh, um, clearly uh, would be putting um, his health at risk by the recommendation that he comes back to the detention centre. And I would submit from his, his qualifications and from his career and from dealing with the elderly community for such a period of time, he is unlikely to be putting forward to you, Your Honours, a situation which is quite different um, to what is put forward by Defence Council. It may be the case that Defence Council have had uh, times where Mr. Yang Sari could only communicate for 15 minutes, but that's, that's not the evidence that's before you. That's evidence from Council. And when we look at the assessment done uh, by Dr. Campbell, it was done over a two-day period. It was done a week ago. And when he was asked what was the ability of uh, Mr. Yang Sari to concentrate? He said, I spoke to him for an hour and a half, and he was able to engage in quite an um, interactive manner. And then he said he saw him in the afternoon of the same day, and he was able to engage with him as well. And then he saw him the following day, and he said he was able to engage with him. He undertook the mini mental state examination test, the diagnostic test, that actually states whether or not um, someone can concentrate, and um, he scored high in that test. And his conclusion at the end was that his ability to participate in the trial is the same as the conclusion that he had on the 3rd of September. And have no real evidence before you that between the 3rd of September and early November that um, Mr. Yang Sari's mental capacity had in fact dropped. You heard some evidence um, in testimony earlier in September where on one occasion um, the interview could only go for or the diagnosis with the doctors at the hospital could only proceed for 15 minutes. Um, however, other interviews in relation to his uh, medical help, um, they all related to 15-minute uh, time periods, which uh, Dr. Campbell said was the, uh, the normal time period for um, gaining information from the patient. Perhaps, um, Your Honours, I'll um, ask for your guidance here. But our, our submission is that um, Your Honours must decide on this issue um, of whether or not Mr. Yang Sari is uh, fit to plead. Um, the issue is uh, before you now. You have the evidence before you. And if at a later time um, Mr. Yang Sari's uh, mental state or condition declines, if there's a significant difference between now and sometime in the future, um, of course, the prosecution would have no objections for a re-examination, and um, that would be appropriate. Um, there's no point having someone standing trial if they're not fit to stand trial. That's a breach of an accused right. And so, all, all that we would ask is that, as of now, um, the 
the, the, the position is right for you to decide. The defence has put forward that is not fit to plead. Professor Campbell has put forward quite significantly uh, in his, uh, state, in his uh, expert report and in his testimony that he is fit to plead. Um, Dr Faisal and Dr Hood, um, only two months ago, were of the exact same opinion. Dr Campbell has said only a week ago his condition hasn't changed since when he saw him two months ago. But what counsel for the defence appears to be referring to more is his physical condition and the fact that um, his care, more care is required for his physical condition. But the ultimate test for your honours is not whether or not Yang Sari has five ailments or ten ailments or fifteen ailments or if uh, he needs some extra care. That must be provided by the ECC. That's, that's the ECC's responsibility. However, the issue before your honours is um, is, he fit, is he mentally fit to plead? Can he uh, understand the nature of the charges, the course of the police proceedings, the details of the evidence? Can he instruct counsel, understand the consequences of the proceedings? Can he testify? And you've had three experts over a two-month period that have all said the same thing. He can. And I would submit, Your Honours, it, it may be um, dangerous um, to not decide on this issue now. If at a later time this issue becomes a point um, after a decision in this case, the completion of this case, a point on appeal, um, uh, judges would probably like to know in a higher court, as of this date, what was your view? on whether Yang Sari was fit to plead, because that will play into um, how they assess um, the, the proper process of this trial. And we certainly um, appreciate and um, thank the defence for having a, uh, a very accommodating approach to um, provide waivers when he's at the hospital so that these other witnesses can be heard. Um, but we submit that that approach will still happen. Um, but it is important, Your Honours, that um, a decision is, decision is made on this issue now for the record and for um, purposes further down, further down the track. As far as the type of expert, whether it be this, um, Dr Bernstein or someone else, um, if, if it was required later, um, I mean, we would submit that uh, you know, the qualifications and the reasoning behind um, those experts or that, that expert or other experts could be put forward by the defence and the prosecution and civil parties could do the same. But then, you know, ultimately, uh, as this is the, the civil law system, um, it's important for you to decide. For you to decide if an extra expert is required at a later time, and who should that be? But I think it's important not to be under the misapprehension that uh, this would be asking for a second opinion now. Um, in fact, Dr Campbell, Dr Faisal and Dr Hood are three doctors, three qualified doctors, doctors that have given three opinions um, as to his mental state as of about now in the last two months, with the only difference being in that time period is a, a weakness in his physical health, which Dr Campbell has said can be managed appropriately with medication. Uh, with um, medical assistance such as a brace and, and, a, and a proper bed, etc. But there's been no um, statement by doctors during this two month period saying Yang Sari um, is not mentally fit to plead, other than that one incident where a doctor stated that um, they spoke to him in the hospital for 15 minutes and then he couldn't concentrate. Other than that one incident, there's been no evidence before you that the mental state of Yang Sari has changed since the 3rd of September report to the 
4th and 5th of November. And even if it did, which we, we submit there's no evidence there, on the 4th and 5th of November, it must have changed back. But obviously the position was, uh, the position is that uh, it's likely that uh, there was no change in the mental state of uh, Mr. Yang Sari. Your Honours, um, I'll, I'll, I'll be brief now, but um, if I can just refer you to the, uh, the Strugar decision um, from the International Criminal Tribunal of the former Yugoslavia. Um, and that decision uh, is in, was uh, entitled um, de Decision Re, the Defence Motion to, determine, to Terminate Proceedings. There was, there's, a, there's a few principles in there other than uh, the, uh, the method or the test or the criteria to determine whether an accused is fit to plead. Um, as far as the seven capacities that need to be measured, you've heard evidence about that, you've heard it um, from Dr Campbell in the 3rd of September report, Mr Yang Gassari understood each and every capacity and gave full answers to show that he had um, the ability to plead and stand trial. That was absolutely clear from the 3rd of September report. And I think um, from Council, um, there's a concession today that certainly from there, from their view, um, the 3rd of September, um, he was uh, fit to plead and stand trial. And as, as you've heard from Professor Campbell, when he spoke to him two months later, his view did not change after an hour and a half discussion with him on the Monday morning. But the other um, principles I would just refer to, I won't quote, um, because of the time. Um, and it's, it's a core principle that comes through the Strugar case. And it states that ultimately the inquiry into the medical condition of an accused, the causes of the conditions, the causes of the symptoms, is not your primary role. Your primary role uh, as a trial chamber is to determine whether or not um, he is fit to plead and stand trial. And once you satisfy yourself of that fact, whether um, some tingling or some numbness or some dizziness is caused by um, that condition of VBI or whether it's caused by another condition or another condition, um, it's not uh, really a relevant issue. The issue is, are you satisfied that he can meaning, meaningfully participate uh, in his defence? Of course, health is interrelated and there, not, there must be a discussion about health to see whether that impacts on uh, Mr Yang Sari's ability to meaningfully participate. But once that is satisfied, that the experts, the psychiatrists and the geriatrician are satisfied that he can meaningfully participate and demonstrate that fact, then the issue of causes and, and, and what's causing his symptoms is not so much an issue that your honours need to concern yourself with uh, under the law. That said, from the ECC's perspective, um, his health um, and his medical care is of utmost concern. But that's a different issue. Um, which is dealt with in another way. I, I refer to paragraph 35 and paragraph 46 for that principle. The second principle um, I would ask um, Your Honours to take into account in deciding this issue is that Your Honours should only be, uh, of course, uh, considering evidence that is before you. Dr Bernstein's letter 
Um, the one that was done in 24 hours, with no consultation with the accused, with no analysis of uh, the medical records, with no understanding of the prior history of Mr. Yang Sari. Um, that is not evidence before you, Your Honours, allowed parties to uh, seek uh, some advice so we could understand um, uh, Professor Campbell's evidence more. But that's not evidence before you. And, and similarly, um, uh, remarks made by counsel as to the condition of Mr. Yang Sari when they speak to, them, speak, speak to him, that is not evidence before you. Your Honours uh, must um, make your decision on evidence rather than purely a submission. Um, and the reason for that, of course, is that counsel can't be cross-examined as to the facts that are being put forward. It's untested. And so, Your Honours, the evidence before you has to be of such that you feel confident and you can rely on. And if, if Your Honours feel as though that you need more, you're not confident about his ability to to stand trial. You're not confident about Professor Campbell's uh, testimony in his report, and you're not confident about Dr. Faisal and Dr. Hood. Um, of course, um, we, would, uh, we would ask that Your Honours um, gain that confidence by asking for another expert. However, we would submit, Your Honours, um, three experts in two months with a unanimous view after um, extensive and detailed uh, examination of the accused um, should leave you in no doubt as to his fitness right now. Um, a defence counsel has said his, his uh, condition is uh, precarious, and that's true. And that's true. But if we get to that point where there's a significant change from what Dr. Campbell has said, then of course uh, we would all in this courtroom support that another expert or a Professor Campbell, or, uh, Dr. Faisal, Dr. Hood, and perhaps some other expert be called as well. It's important. And counsel can put forward their uh, suggestions in that regard. But ultimately, it's not a common law system, it's a civil law system, and ultimately your honours have to be satisfied with the qualifications and the experience of the people that are put forward. Our submission, your honours, is that if right now you call for another expert, it, would, it, it is unnecessary because you have three opinions. There needs to be a significant change. Because if there's no significant change and we still call another expert, if that expert comes along and a party doesn't like that expert, then they would ask again and again and it would never end. And the Strugar decision at paragraph 20. Five at page seven um, focuses on this. They talk about there must be an adequate reason. And certainly, Your Honours, we would submit, um, bearing in mind Mr. Yang Sari was examined extensively uh, last week um, by a professor that knew him well and was still of the view that he was fit to plead. That would be unnecessary, a waste of court time and resources. Finally, um, in relation to uh, the issue of fitness, fitness to plead and, and the burden of proof, um, certainly at the Yugoslavia Tribunal, there's a presumption that an accused is fit to plead. However, to determine unfitness, Your Honours, certainly at the international tribunals, must find on the balance of probabilities that it's more likely than not that the accused is not fit to plead. That's the, the standard that's used at the, other, at the other tribunals. And so we would submit, um, Your Honours, we certainly, having heard Professor Campbell's testimony the other day and the documentary support, we're certainly not at that stage where we can say on the balance of probabilities Mr Yang Sari is not fit to plead. 
In fact, it's clearly the other way around. Your Honours, to conclude, um, we, firstly, we would ask that you not postpone a decision for the problems it will create in the future. It may create in the future. Uh, we ask that you give your decision um, as soon as possible. Um, we would submit the trial to continue as normal, either with his presence in the courtroom, but if Mr Yang Sari doesn't feel comfortable in the courtroom, which from the professor at this point in time, that seems that may be the case, uh, from the holding cell with all of the appropriate equipment and care, or if necessary, um, at any other place in a future time. If he had to go back to the hospital and he was still mentally fit, clearly we could set up audio-visual perhaps from the hospital. But that's something that's, that's in the future. But we would ask the trial continue. Um, you've got no evidence, no evidence before you that casts significant doubt or any doubt in relation to Professor Campbell, Dr Faisal and Dr Hood's opinion. That letter provided by um, the defence um, the other day from Dr Bernstein, um, that, was, that, that opinion was not based on enough information, so its value is very, very small. Um, further assessments are not currently required. There's no adequate reason to get another one. At some point in time, there may be. And just to make it clear, the, you know, the ongoing medical care uh, of Mr Yang Sari, of course, is of the utmost importance of this institution, but the fact that he requires some extra personal care doesn't take away from Dr Campbell's view and Dr Cook's view and Dr Faisal's view that Yang Sari is fit to stand trial. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bonjour Monsieur le Président, bonjour Mesdames et Messieurs les juges et bonjour à tous. Je crois que ce que nous a dit notre confrère de la défense de Yen Sari à l'instant est quelque chose que la Chambre avait anticipé de la même façon que les procureurs et nous-mêmes l'avions anticipé. C'est-à-dire que la défense de Yen Sari nous indique que la position est d'attendre que nous pouvons pendant quelques semaines encore écouter des personnes pour lesquelles il a renoncé à son droit d'être présent, mais qu'il est clair que M. Yang Sari est inapte et que le moment venu, la défense de Yang Sari demandera si nécessaire la disjonction. C'est donc très clair et ça a évidemment un impact extrêmement important, non seulement bien sûr pour M. Yang Sari, mais aussi pour les partis civils pour la tenue de ce procès et la décision que votre Chambre va prendre aura bien sûr un impact aussi sur la position des autres accusés. Je pense que c'est assez clair dès maintenant et que c'est quelque chose à quoi nous devons penser. Alors nous avons accepté bien sûr le moment venu que M. Yang Sari soit hospitalisé compte tenu de son état de santé. Nous avons accepté les modifications à l'agenda tout à fait normal. Puis nous avons eu les conclusions du docteur Campbell. Ce ne sont pas les premières conclusions puisque le docteur Campbell a déjà à plusieurs reprises examiné M. Yang Sari. Ces conclusions sont extrêmement claires et non équivoques. Elles l'étaient dans son rapport. Elles l'étaient encore davantage à l'audience la semaine Dernière. Le docteur Campbell nous dit qu'il n'est pas nécessaire et même nocif de maintenir M. Yang Sari à l'hôpital et le docteur Campbell nous dit qu'il n'y a aucune inaptitude tant physique que mentale de M. Yang Sari à l'heure actuelle. À 
La défense devient une série conteste les conclusions du docteur Campbell et conteste sa, médo sa méthodologie et son sérieux. Alors, je rappellerai quand même que le docteur Campbell, il y a quelques semaines, a rendu un rapport concernant Mme Yann Thierry, qui a été considéré ici autant par la défense de Mme Yang Thierry que par celle de M. Yang Sari, que par les procureurs, comme un document suffisamment sérieux et suffisamment fondé pour que la Chambre se prononce en considérant que Mme Yang Thierry était inapte. Aujourd'hui, les conclusions du même professeur Campbell, les dernières conclusions, puisque le rapport du 3 septembre n'a pas été contesté, les dernières conclusions ne conviennent pas à la défense de M. Yang Sari, malgré la clarté et le fondement sur lesquels s'appuient ses conclusions. J'ai écouté attentivement mon confrère la semaine dernière, je l'ai écouté ce matin, je n'ai pas entendu le moindre argument médical fondé qui viendrait à l'encontre des conclusions du professeur Campbell. Je dirais qu'il ne suffit pas qu'un rapport ne convienne pas à une partie pour que cette partie considère qu'il y a lieu de demander une nouvelle expertise. Je partage tout à fait les commentaires de M. le procureur quand il dit que notre Chambre ne peut pas se fonder, bien sûr, sur les commentaires de l'avocat de M. Yang Sari, cela va de soi. Et je partage également les conclusions de M. le procureur quand il dit que nous avons des rapports d'expertise extrêmement clairs et que la lettre du professeur Burstein, qui ne constitue que des critiques de forme, n'apporte aucun, aucune critique substantielle sur, ce, sur les conclusions du professeur Campbell. Par conséquent, je pense qu'aujourd'hui, tout comme les procureurs, la partie civile demande à la Chambre de ne pas attendre, parce que la position raisonnable, ce n'est pas d'attendre jusqu'au mois de janvier. La partie civile presse la Chambre de rendre une décision le plus rapidement possible. La partie civile demande à la Chambre de rejeter la demande d'expertise parce qu'elle n'est absolument pas fondée. Et la partie civile demande, bien sûr, à la Chambre de se prononcer aujourd'hui en l'état actuel des choses, en considérant que M. Yang Sari est apte tant physiquement que mentalement à assister et à participer à ce procès. Nous avons donc une position tout à fait commune avec M. le procureur. Je conclurai simplement en disant que si la présence de M. Yang Sari à l'audience est un droit pour lui, c'est aussi incontestablement un devoir, en quelque sorte, à l'égard des partis civils et à l'égard du public, pour autant, bien sûr, que cette présence soit possible. Nous considérons aujourd'hui que les rapports d'expertise médicaux concluent à cette possibilité. Nous demandons donc à la Chambre de la Constitution. Mr. President, your honors, uh, I would indeed, I would indeed. Let me begin by touching upon first what the uh, civil party lawyer indicated that uh, what does not suit the Ingsuri defense, given that Dr. Campbell's re report on his wife in Tarit. Let me remind the civil parties that we had nothing to do with Ing Turret. It was, she was not our client. The issues were wholly different. And we should not be mixing apples and oranges. I was just looking at the word precipitate. I don't know why they came to mind to hasten the occurrence of. And I think that that's what we're about 
to embark upon uh, should you go ahead and decide at this stage that based on what you've heard uh, that Mr. Xeri is indeed competent to plead as the prosecution uh, states. Now, let's let me remind the trial chamber that we don't have any video recordings or tape recordings or anything to see exactly how Mr. Ingsri was during the examination of Dr. Campbell. We have to take his word as face value. Now, normally, uh, one would not want to be in the middle of an examination, a lawyer that is, because they do tend to be disruptive, but nothing prevents a videotaping of the presentation, especially when we're talking about something that's rather subjective. Uh, back in 21 December 2009, in fact, we had asked whether the first evaluation psychiatric examination of our client was reported, and we received an answer that it had not been, and I'm referring to uh, document number 338-6 and B38-5. These are dated 21 December 2009 and based on a 16 December 2009 document received by the, by the um, uh, based on our letter to the OCIJ. On 16 March 2011, we requested that the examination be taken, the examination of Mr. Ingsby be taken place in the presence of one of the defense uh, members, just as a passive observer. We would, however, for all future purposes, ask that any examination be video recorded, especially when we're dealing with the observations of our client. And I take to heart what the prosecution said, even though I come from a legal tradition where I'm viewed as an officer of the court, and what I say in court is as if it's under oath. Uh, that in and of itself is not evidence. It should not be taken as evidence. Uh, so uh, I take that. The prosecution says it is dangerous to, uh, to not make a decision at this point in time uh, because of what may happen on appeal. Well, I think we need not worry about that because we have the waivers, unless, unless there's a concern by the trial chamber that the waivers themselves were provided under circumstances when Mr. Ingsuri was not competent. But based on the submissions made, based on the waivers, based on the language in the waivers, and based on the fact that the waivers have been accepted, especially by the prosecution, and they have never call, called into question the waivers, it would seem that uh, there is no need to worry about somehow the defense in a rather a clever way trying to set the stage up for the appeal process by creating error into the process, something that is commonly done at times by defense lawyers. And so I'm fully, I'm fully familiar with the, uh, the tactic, but I can assure um, your honors that this is not one of those cases. Uh, now, it is up to you whether you wish to decide to find on the basis of what you have before you that Mr. Ingsuri is indeed competent. But as I indicated, that would be uh, somewhat, that, would might, that might precipitate the defense into employing a range of other options as I articulated earlier today such as if indeed there is a finding which we submit uh, would be in error, then 
perhaps because we would be waiving 8.4 appeal or we would be looking to be less than diligent, we certainly would need to revisit the issue of the waivers. And it would be my advice to the client so that there is no uh, misunderstanding for appeal purposes that he withdraw those waivers and that we proceed with his full presence and we would submit his presence in court and I'll explain why, but of course if the alternative within the detention center we would ask that the video be on him so he can be monitored at all times. I do not want to be engaged in a charade where the client is asleep, he can't be seen, and we all pretend that he is participating. And what I find objectionable, and Mr. Engel Dom finds objectionable, objectionable, is the fact that we're saying that since we're dealing with an 88-year-old gentleman who's got a whole host of problems, that somehow the standard of pleading should be less than if someone is a more robust individual. That we can tolerate somebody dozing in and out and, and then kid ourselves that these are international standards. So I would caution against making any findings at this point in time because there's no need to make any findings at this point in time. But should the trial chamber make findings, then we would need to revisit certain issues with our client, and that's what we have attempted not to do. We don't try, we're trying not to precipitate a situation where we would have to go down the road of severance. Now, uh, the prosecution uh, likes to quote from the ICY, a place that is uh, perhaps has, has given us the world over, that is, lots of jurisprudence in the last few years in this field, and a place that I pulled here, well, it's dear to my heart, at least, having spent 10 years there. But if we look at the Strugar case, if we look at the Strugar case, and if we look at the judgment of 17 July 2008, this is the, uh, the number is 01-42-A, that is uh, the case number. But if we look at this particular Decision. On paragraph 55, they have a conclusion. It can be found on. Paragraph 55. They The case number is IT-01-42-A. That's the case number. This is the case I suspect that the prosecution was referring to. This is a judgment dated 17 July 2008. And on a, if it's a trial, I'm um, sorry, I don't, don't want to interrupt, but the, we were referring to the trial decision and then that went on appeal. And so, yeah, it's, a it's the same person. The file chamber laid out certain criteria. We all accept that. No matter when on appeal, this issue was appealed. And of course, uh, what is controlling in many ways is what the appeal chamber says. And they qualified some parts of the trial chamber's findings. And on paragraph 55, it says, and I'm reading in the middle of it, as noted above, the applicable standard is that of meaningful 
participation which allows Nikyu to exercise his fair trial rights to such a degree that he is able to participate effectively in his trial and has an understanding of the essentials of the proceedings. It then goes on. In this respect, the trial chamber applied the standard correctly as evidence by its conclusion that an accused fitness to stand trial should turn on whether his capacities quote, viewed overall in a reasonable and common sense manner at such a level that it is possible for him or her to participate in the proceedings in some cases with assistance and sufficiently exercise the identified Right. And that's close of quote from the trial chamber. Now what I want to focus on and what I would like your honors to focus on is the word where it says here common sense. You don't need to be a medical doctor to know that if somebody is dozing in and out, common sense tells us they're not following the proceedings. They're present, but not mentally. And how does one follow the proceedings? And how will we be able to track them following the proceedings unless we view Mr. Luxury at all times to see whether he's dozing in and out? And during those periods when he is too fatigued, or when he is seeing double vision, or when he is uh, experiencing dizziness, or when he's in pain and is unable to follow, do we take a recess, five minutes, ten minutes? Do we interrupt the proceedings? That's what we're talking about. And so, when applying the Sugar uh, elements, we have to use our common sense. I wasn't there at the, uh, when Mr. Sri was being examined, neither was the prosecution, neither were you, Your Honors. We are left with Dr. Campbell's observations. And on that particular day, maybe Ng Sri was having a good day, but not every day is necessarily a good day. So, we leave it to your discretion. We think it is not necessary at this point in time because it may precipitate a cause of action from our point of view and this is not a threat. This is because of due diligence because we take our obligations quite seriously. It may require us then so that we don't, we're not perceived as having waived any particular rights or acquiesced that at this point in time, irrespective of our submissions, uh, Mr. Ng Shri is competent. It may require us to, to, uh, to file uh, for additional, submi additional submissions. And of course, we would be asking for an independent expert uh, to examine Mr. Imshiri. We don't think it is necessary at this time because we have the waiver. It hasn't been necessary for the last month and a half. And so our right submissions are that we proceed as we have been proceeding and let's see what happens. Uh, at some point. Of course, I understand the trial chamber's concern and I understand the prosecution's uh, concern as a civil party. They want certainty at this time. And if that is the course of action that you decide to take, then so be it. We will understand that. But we then have to reconsider because one of my obligations, I should say our obligations, is to ensure that we are providing meaningful representation at all times and that we are diligent and we take our responsibilities quite seriously. It may not appear that way at times, but we do. And we try. And we're certainly trying to find creative approaches so that we can proceed as best we can until some circumstance 
uh, decides otherwise without any interruption. And again, Your Honor, let me thank you. Let me thank you on behalf of Ms. Honor uh, and I, uh, on behalf of Ms. Sri, let me thank the trial chamber for allowing us these submissions. It's a terribly important submission, and we are glad to, that you have uh, had them in the public because I think these are, these are very important. Uh, issues Panyan that need to be discussed publicly. Thank you. Mr. Canavas, one last question. Uh, it, it appears to me that you are of the view that your client, Ying Sari, is currently unfit. However, you do not want the trial chamber to make such a decision. You would prefer it if the trial chamber continued and muddled through with witnesses, experts and the like that he has no concern with. Uh, my, my problem is that if we do that, and that is the basis on which the trial chamber proceeds, then it seems at least possible that we are continuing a trial of Ying Sari when he is not fit. Uh, I, I'm not quite sure how we get ourselves out of this dilemma. I clearly understand you don't want a decision at the moment. I, I don't quite see how we're going to proceed without clarifying the current situation. So uh, are you able to help me without just, uh, and no one's suggesting, I, I might say, no one's suggesting that the Ying Sari team is not diligent, n not at all. Um, the, the question is, how do we proceed from here? Uh, and how do we resolve this matter uh, without uh, this uh, conundrum that we're currently faced with? Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you, uh, Judge Cartwright. Well, let me begin by saying that uh, Mr. Ingsri's fitness is limited to the extent of being able to participate for very limited periods of time, such as 10 or 15 minutes, off and on, uh, long enough for us to give him some instructions. That, in our right for submission, is not sufficient to meet the test uh, for the fair trial rights that he is entitled to under the Cambodian Constitution uh, and the laws applied to this particular uh, institution. Uh, we are hopeful, and I guess hope springs eternal that he, his condition will improve. And that's why we have taken the position that as long as we have these waivers of these witnesses and no more, the business of the trial can go on. Uh, part of our concern was not to be disruptive. Uh, but we're not, uh, well, we don't think that it is necessary at this point in time because of these waivers for the trial chamber to make a decision. Were it to make a decision, as I've indicated, then it puts us in a different posture, in a different position where we may have to take certain measures, which obviously we're trying to avoid at this point in time. Uh, but we leave it to your sound discretion. I'm not trying to have it both ways. I certainly don't want to box the trial chamber into any particular position. If the trial chamber wishes to make a finding at this point in time, then so be it. Uh, then we will proceed accordingly. I'm trying, to, we're trying to be measured, reasonable, and creative at the same time respecting our clients' rights. But at, at no time are we saying that he's fit to participate in the proceedings as they're ongoing right now, and even if you reduce them to half a day, he is not going to be fit. But if you make that decision, then we certainly would have to uh, have a conversation with our client, ask him to withdraw his his waivers, and then, of course, we will want full view of Mr. Ng in the state that he is in at all times so that 
Yes, he can be in a com he can be comfortable, but also we need to be sure exactly what it is that we're saying is competent to participate in politics. And I should end by saying this. I think when we are to answer that question, we should be asking ourselves if we were in a position of somebody that we care was in the same position in circumstances, Mr. Inksri, would we be saying that that person was following, was competent in following the proceedings of this nature? And I dare say no, none of us in this courtroom would say yes. Thank you. Thank you.